I'd like to also add my wishes to all the mothers and I'd like to pay a tribute to my son's wives who are mothers and they're not here today but hopefully tomorrow and today they will have a good Mother's Day also. <coughs> um, I'd just like to mention last week in Sabbath School, Diane was up here giving a testimony really to her favourite or one of her favourite hymns. We had that hymn this morning, The Wonder of It All. And you weren't, if you weren't here, you missed something because she painted a very lovely word picture of, of the, the skies and the bush and the surroundings where she lives. And um, I'd like to thank Diane for that. And uh, she had that hymn and I chose that hymn today too, The Wonder of It All. Let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, this morning as we come to you, we pray that in this worship hour we might have your Holy Spirit with each one of us, Lord. And I pray that the words that I might speak might indeed have come from you. And so we ask this, that you will shut us in with your Holy Spirit, please, for Jesus' sake. Amen. This morning I want to give praise to our Creator for the things that he has given us so that we have special perspectives and insights in our lives. If you look up Psalm 139 and verse 14, it says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvellous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Recently our grandchildren came and stayed with us for a few days and um, I got out my collection of shells. I haven't really looked at them for quite some time. Uh, these shells I collected in Papua New Guinea, some in Stewart Island, some even um, down at Moraitai area there at Oriri Point. And there are all manners of shapes and sizes, colours and hues. But the ones that the children seem to be most interested in, and myself, we looked at the most tiny, tiny little shells, which were perfect. And uh, I thought that was good. But then you think, well, a creature used to live inside those shells. And that was long ago, of course. They don't have any of the smell around them that they would have had originally. But um, when we think of the work the works of God's creation, we naturally think of the things that we see around us, the mountains, the trees, the flowers, the birds, and the things that we can see, and they help us appreciate his creation. Often the last thing that we think of are our own bodies, and in particular the five senses the vast majority of us are born with. Sometimes there are children who are born prematurely and their senses, their eyes have not developed properly and these babies need special care in special circumstances so that they will grow and mature properly. Some years ago, in fact 40 plus years ago, we were living in Dunedin and um, Tim Greenfield and his wife Sandra were there as well. And one night in the middle of the night, it must have been about one o'clock in the morning, we got a phone call and it was from Tim. And Tim rang us to tell us that they had a new baby girl, just born. She was born prematurely. And in those days, they didn't have the knowledge, the medical people didn't have the knowledge to look after these babies. They didn't realise that the oxygen would harm their eyesight. And unfortunately, Kerry... She wasn't born blind, but she became blind because of that circumstance. It's very sad. Their, their joy would have turned into sadness, as it did with us all. I remember very vividly the day that Kerry was um, dedicated to the Lord, and Alan Lindsay was there in Dunedin, and he held that little child. And he talked about one day her sight would be given to her. There's something to think about, isn't it? <clears throat> Sometimes 
people develop a sixth sense. We've got five senses, but sometimes we develop a sixth sense, which is really an awareness of certain situations. When we lived in Papua New Guinea, we had that sixth sense. And that was, well, I tried to instill it into our children. Don't leave toys, don't leave tools, don't leave things on the line, because as Jimmy, I think I saw Jimmy there, would know, maybe not so bad now, or maybe it is even worse. There is so much stealing that goes on. And if you want to look after your things, you've got to be aware of where they are and keep them inside and out of sight. In South Africa, we also had that sixth thing. Well, I did anyway. I don't know about so much the rest of the family. And um, we didn't lose anything. But when we went to Madagascar, we forgot it momentarily. We were in the city and um, we were going, or well, Len and the secretary treasurer we were going from office to office so that he could get permission to work in the country. He'd left in the car a satchel which had our driver's license in it, American dollars, um, various papers, and when we came back, the little window in the side of the car in the window was open or broke, I don't know whether it was broken, but it was forced, and that had gone. It pays to have a sixth sense or to have an awareness of what is going on around you. Now, I know that we all know what our five senses are, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Very important to each one of us, isn't it? Because it helps us to enjoy life. It's the way we taste our food. It's the way we hear things that are going on around about us. It's the way we see things. These are things that God has given us for our benefit. And each of these senses provides us with a separate dimension in which we can appreciate the things around us. Recently, I spent a few hours looking in an old um, medical book that we have at home. It's called Grey's Anatomy. It's nothing to do with the Grey's TV program. But um, it has in it, in very, very fine detail, the way our bodies are put together. I'm sure that the book is outdated, but um, it was used by dental and medical uh, students in the past. Nerves, muscles, organs, blood vessels, they're all there. And I was looking at this thing for a while and I thought, no, it's too much for me. It's just too intricate for me. I would much rather just realise that God has made us and he has made us in such a wonderful fashion. Let's look at Acts uh, chapter 17 and verse 24. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And 27 and 28, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Again, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Well, when you think of the ear, we don't have just one ear on the external there. We have three ears. We've got an external ear, a middle ear, and an internal ear. And the external ear works as a collecting funnel for the sound waves which hit the eardrum and hence travel on over these three little bones. You know the name of those bones? The hammer, the stirrup, and the anvil. And they transport the message to the auditory nerve and then that is translated to the brain. Have you ever realised that these vibrations are sounded off from things around us and it's almost instant that we get, we know what that sound is. It is the same thing really with our eyes. <clears throat> and 
the thing is that immediately we see something, I'm looking at you now, and immediately I know who and what I'm looking at. And I think that is just so amazing that that can happen instantly. Sometimes um, hearing, sight and heat, they tell us the things that are occurring some distance from the body. So it can be quite a distance away. You can still see things even though they are a distance away. When it comes to t um, smell, with the sense of smell, it comes with the, you know, with the things that are set up from the food and drink around us. And these, these things come to us, these sensations come to us through the receptors in the, in the tongue and the nose. The nose and the tongue taste are very closely knit together. I know because I've recently lost a lot of my sense of taste or sense of smell. I sort of have the taste okay. Sometimes I get a, a bit of both. And sometimes it's better than others. So appreciate the taste of good food while you can because if you, when you get old, as all these things seem to happen, we lose our hearing, we lose our eyesight. And I think the Lord knew what he was doing when he said when we came to the age of 70, that was our allotted span. And so when that time comes, oftentimes we lose some of these wonderful things that we have in our senses. <clears throat> Another one, touching. These come to us, we, we realise what, what there is. We have this knowledge because of the um, receptors in our skin. And remember, the skin is our, the biggest organ in our body because it covers our whole body. But if, unfortunately, if these receptors are damaged, as in the people in leprosy, or because of injury, that person has lost the ability to feel. Now, all these things that I've talked about so far are called external senses, but there are internal senses that send messages to the brain that take place in our bodies. And scientists have found that human beings have other kind of senses too that give information about the body's needs. Now these include hunger, pain and thirst. We could call the senses gifts because we can be more sensitive to people and to situations around us. Let's look at the life of Jesus and some of his experiences. Let's start with the thought of touch. In the majority of healings that he did, but not all, Jesus touched the sick, the lepers and the blind, Jairus's daughter, the woman with the hemorrhage for 12 years. Ah, though she is the one who touched Christ, Jesus was sensitive as to what his touch could do for others. What about when it came to the children? The disciples wanted to send the children away, but the mothers wanted Jesus to bless those children. And um, he told, he said to the disciples, let them come, suffer it to be so, let them come. And so Jesus was often found with children on his lap. And no doubt he would have touched their heads and blessed them. Think about when Jesus was in the upper room celebrating the Last Supper. There was no servant there to wash the, wash the disciples' feet, but it needed to be done. And Jesus took the part of the servant. Desire of Ages tells us in page 645, When the Saviour's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with the towel, Judas thrilled through and through. And he had the impulse there and then to confess his sin, but he wouldn't humble himself. He hardened his heart against repentance. Remember in the Garden of Eden, the mob had grown bold and Peter, is, he's really rash and he was upset because they had come to get Jesus. And he gets there with his sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant. I guess it was dark and perhaps not everybody knew who had cut the ear off. 
Now, Jesus did something. I've just, I only just sort of picked this up recently, but Christ's hands were tied at this time. And when he saw what had be, happened to the servants here, he released his hands from the, the binds that they had around him. And they were firmly bound. And then he put up his hand and he touched that servant's ear. Let it be so, he said. He touched the wounded ear and immediately it became whole. Then I thought, well, Jesus must have subjected himself to be bound, to have his hands bound again. Now, when it comes to hearing, I've thought about Jesus' hearing. He would have, in the garden, he would have heard about that mob that came. He also heard, as time went on, the derision that the scribes and the Pharisees had given him time and time and time again. How many times did Jesus hear the scathing and the rebukes of the, of the set scribes and Pharisees? How many times did Jesus hear the disciples disputing about who was going to be on the right-hand side of him in his new political situation? How many times did people call out to him, if you can, you can make me whole? How about the derision that Jesus heard in the, the hall, in Pilate's hall? The condemnation of the people when they were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And what about the two people that were on the cross next to him? One cried out, save thyself and us. That was the, the one. And the other one said, Lord, save me in your kingdom. Those two were the, completely the opposite, weren't they? What about the weeping of the women at his crucifixion? What about the cry of the Roman soldier? As he let out this cry, he said, Truly, this was the Son of God. What about on the resurrection morning? The call of his father, the great earthquake... The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled away the stone. Jesus heard all these amazing things and he saw them as well. Now when it comes to tasting, did Jesus have a, a non-tasting life? Nothing like it. As a young boy in his, in his parents' home, Jesus would have enjoyed simple food that was prepared by his mother. Perhaps olives and grapes, I mean, we don't think grapes are such a, a cheap food here, but in that country, it would have been a simple food. Barley loaves and fish, the things that he would have had, the, the food of the country. Then later on, he relied on the hospitality of his friends and followers. What about when Jesus turned the water into wine and everybody said what wonderful tasting wine it was? I know that Jesus would have probably tasted that wine as well. Matthew 24, oh sorry, Matthew 27, verse 34. I'm using my very, very old King James Bible, which is really, I've had it for many, many years and it is falling to pieces. Matthew 27 and verse 34. When Jesus was on the cross, he was thirsty and he called out, for, he said, I thirst. So what did they do? They filled a sop or some sort of spongy material. They filled it with vinegar and gall. Now the gall was, I read, was like a narcotic. But when Jesus tasted this, he refused to have any more. Wouldn't it have been wonderful had somebody had given him some pure water at that time? This is what it said in verse 34. 
They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink it. Later, when, it, when Jesus prepared the breakfast for the disciples when they'd been fishing all night, wouldn't that fish and those barley loaves or whatever have tasted simply wonderful because Jesus had prepared it? I think it would have been something special. And when it comes to seeing, Jesus did not miss a thing. His all-seeing eye took in everything. He told us, though, when you see these things come to pass, know that my coming is even at the doors. What things? Well, when we see earthquakes, political storms, wars, man's inhumanity to man, nations distressed, and famines. Those are the things that we can see. We know that, the, and we are aware of the things that we know that are happening in the world today. Jesus was sensitive to the crowds around him. He could tell at a glance if a person wanted their sins forgiven. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Now, when I thought about the things that Jesus may have smelt, as a child, wandering the hills and enjoying the open spaces, Jesus would have smelt the fresh air. He would have drawn it into his body and perhaps enjoyed the perfume of wild flowers. He would have been familiar with the aroma of the wood shavings and the oils used, in, used on the wood in his father's carpenter's shop. He would have been familiar with the aroma of bread making and the grape juice being prepared and the olives. His sense of smell would have been acute. I read a story just recently, although it came out of an old record, and the story is of a doctor who worked in Queensland. And she was working in casualty, and there were two patients that came into the... They were a fiancé, the lady and her fiancé. They came into the, into the um, casualty department and she said that she could actually smell this terrible aroma before she really knew what it was. And as she got in closer to the people, she knew where this dreadful, dreadful smell was. She called the story the stench of sin. And she said that she was really embarrassed. So she went away to another part, a cupboard, to get a long gown to put on her so that her clothes wouldn't be contaminated by the smell. So she put it on and then she came there and as she was putting it on, she started to think, well, these people have a terrible smell. Christ still accepts them and maybe I need to realise that my sin is like that stench. It is something to think about, isn't it? That our sin is like a stench to the Lord. So... The, the couple eventually were treated and they went away, but she, she was filled with this thought that her sin was as bad as the stench of these two couples, these two people. Pain. Remember I said earlier that there was, this is one of the senses, hunger and thirst and pain. What about the pain? Well, some may argue that pain is a good thing because it warns you that something is wrong. Now, there's both mental and physical pain. In an ideal world, we would never have had either pain, but we do have it, don't we? And every person experiences pain, whether it be mental or whether it be physical. As a boy growing up in his poor home, helping his father, in the carpenter's shop, surely Jesus would have got little splinters in his fingers. Or as he was roaming around on the hills, perhaps he stubbed his toe. Or he would have banged his thumb when he was working with the, with the hammer. But I have read in Desire of Ages, page 72, that he was not willing to be defective even in, even in the handling of the tools. He was perfect as a workman. So whether or not he got splinters in his fingers or he stubbed his toe, 
I'm sure that he would have sympathised with other children that had the, had the problem. You know, when you have a little scratch or a little a splinter or a piece of steel, or with me, I get rose prickles in my fingers, and you can't sort of rest until you get rid of it because it's uncomfortable. You only have to have a little cut on your finger for it to, to make you feel as if it's, it's disturbing you, it's irritating you. Is there a difference between a heart full of sorrow and pain? Desire of Ages, page eight, 685. As Jesus neared Gethsemane with his disciples, he became strangely silent. He had often visited this spot here for meditation and prayer, but never with a heart so full of sorrow as this night. Never before had the disciples seen him so utterly sad and silent. Every step that he now took was with laboured effort. He groaned aloud, as if suffering under a terrible burden. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. Christ's soul was filled with dread at the separation from God. And, it comes from uh, Psalm of Ages 687, The human heart longs for sympathy in suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, this is when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort. The one who'd always been there for them was now suffering. Superhuman agony. And he longed to hear some words of comfort from those he had so often blessed and shielded them in sorrow and distress. Rising with painful effort, he staggered to the place where he had left his companions, but he had found them asleep. Page 689. Again the Son of God was seized with superhuman agony and fainting And exhausted, he staggered back to the place of his former struggles, suffering greater than before. Sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus suffered pain, all right. But God suffered with his son. There was silence in heaven. Could we mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in the silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love and glory from his beloved son. This is from page 697 of Desire of Ages. We would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. There was no way of escape for the Son of God. In the judgment hall, every ear was bent to listen and every eye fixed on his face. And Jesus said, Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. How will you view that day? One of the greatest sadnesses inflicted on the heart of Jesus was the denial of Peter. So many chapters dealing with the last few hours of Christ's life on this earth. Are you familiar with them? Talking of pain, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, the cross was lifted by strong men and with great violence thrust into the place prepared for it. This caused the Son of Man the most intense agony to God. Jesus is not insensitive to our needs. We have been created in his likeness, so we have attributes that emulate his character. Some questions to ask. Are you sensitive to other people's needs and their problems, or do you think just about yourself? Do you have sense, Do your senses give you an awareness of God's love for you in the things you hear and see and touch? Does the stench of sin abhor you? Does it bother you or concern you that Jesus paid the utmost for your salvation? 
When we have so much knowledge, how can we neglect so great a salvation? We are Christ's created masterpieces. He is longing to take us into his kingdom and give us more than we ever thought possible. With a renewed body, renewed minds, perhaps other, other abilities that we have never even dreamt of. Maybe they're just in our dreams now. Psalm verse th uh, chapter 20, 34 and verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. We'll just sing, it's a favourite hymn of mine, Marvellous Grace, number 109. Please sing it with, you know, gusto, because it's a beautiful praise hymn. We thank you, Father, for this marvellous grace that you have bestowed on us. We have a refuge in that grace. And help us to take hold of it by faith. We look forward to your strength in the coming days, Lord. And we want to we want ask you to help us develop a sixth sense so that we do have an awareness of the time in which we live and to be a help to others.